Hey everybody, welcome to Indie Game Business. It's a Friday. In the mortal words of Smokey, you ain't got no job and you ain't got sh to do. So we're going to sit here and, and entertain and educate for a little bit. I have Joe Quadar with us from Recurver. Joe comes from a long standing line in the industry working on, you know, games at 2K and games that I, it was another one and I just completely brained out on where else you've been, but it's okay because, you know, our first question is always the same, Joe. So tell us, you know, how you got into the industry initially and walk us through your career up to this point. Yeah, um, it's a long one, so I won't hit every point. But um, actually, so it's uh, in April, I've been in the industry for 20 years. I started in the uh, QA department at Crystal Dynamics. Um, I was a graphic design major and music major and I was playing Tekken. I was not doing my courses, I was playing Tekken at the arcade. And San Jose State had an arcade and we had some really competitive arcade scene as well. And uh, some of the guys that showed up on Wednesdays, they were Sony designers and Crystal Dynamics designers. And they were, when I, when I learned what they did for a living, I was like, oh, you can do this as a job? And they said, yeah, we, and actually you'd be pretty good at it, um, just by the way that you play the game and whatnot. And um, so yeah, so I just, dropped out of college and <laughs> my application for QA. It took another four months or so. And there were other life events that got me to drop out of college. It wasn't, it wasn't a Hail Mary, but um, yeah, Crystal Dynamics in 2001 was a really great place to be. Uh, Amy Hennig had just cut her teeth as a writer on Soul Reaver and uh, Rich LaMartian had just become lead game designer on that same project. And they were still wrapping that up um, while working on Soul Reaver 2. Uh, and it was just, QA wasn't sort of second class, QA was part of the team, so we ate with the team, we hung out, we played Counter-Strike together, um, I stayed late nights to help tune boss battles, and got my taste for both game audio, game production, and design, and so that sort of set, that wet my appetite, so I, um, really just hung on to anybody at Crystal that would give me the time of day. One of those people was uh, a guy named John Schwanick, or Chow, and he's a producer, and he made this Faustian deal with me. He's like, if you be my producer for a little bit, I'll let you be a designer eventually. But he really wanted me to learn game production first, because he'd seen too many designers just make last minute changes or wild, I <laughs> wild ideas over the weekend that completely changed what the team had been working on. So. Um, I trusted him. I, I had seen him do a lot of good at the company. So I, I said yes, and that ended up being a lot more time than I expected. It was like three or four years in production, but I think it was valuable time. Um, we worked on a really big project that never came out called Downfall, um, and a lot of hard lessons learned from there. Uh, I went over to the East Coast to a company called Big Huge Games, where I was lead combat designer on uh, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, which recently got a re-release. Um, came back, worked on Tomb Raider, which I had been part of the original reboot team, so they pulled me back in to help close out one of the Tomb Raider reboots as well. And then uh, I had this job offer just sort of sitting in my email inbox of like be a design director at 2K Publishing, and I had no idea what that meant. Uh, but I went ahead and talked to them anyway, and it seemed kind of cool. So I said, let's, let's try it. And it was just a wild switch from being a developer to being in, in publishing. And um, how do you look at go from looking at one game and thinking about one game for three, four, or five years to suddenly seven games in a span of a week and having to have an opinion, an expert opinion at that on it, and also trust the teams that they're going to fix things. So that was um, it was a wild change for me, but I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed sort of the um, switching from low level detail to high level and only speaking at high level and really trusting people. But uh, in the end, I was like, I like what I do, but wh whenever I would work with the team, I felt what I call the wall of publishing. They would always, someone would be looking at me with um, a little suspicion whether it, like either the lead designer would not like <laughs> another designer showing up or if the lead designer liked me showing up and we were working well together, still there was a producer that was really upset that somebody from publishing was there. And it's like, I think we all got along, but you can never really fully break through the trust barrier. Um, 
so I dabbled in consulting and 2K said, yeah, that's fine. You can do the same job you do. You can still work with us and contract. And that was kind of a new thing for them, but it worked out really well. And after that first year, I started getting some indie, indie clients. Um, for instance, I worked with uh, Ember Lab down in Orange County, and they've got a game coming out this year called Kena Bridge of Spirits. It's on PS5, and it's just a beautiful game. It's a beautiful team. It's their first game ever, and I had so much fun working with them. I was like, this is what I want to do full time. I just want to work with indie clients. Um, so that's it. So I sort of switched the business to focus only on indies. I still help the big big companies out, they pay well, but they usually have a, a fire to fix and not a lot of time to fix it. And I, f I feel like when I help Indies, like we usually, we get we get started a little bit more earlier. We get we have more time to um, strategize and get the job done. So that's it, that's that's me. I live in Santa Cruz now. Um, it affords me a beach walk each day and that clears my head. And here we are. Yeah. That's similar. It's snowing outside. I can go walk out <laughs> in that if I if I need to. The so what's what's unique about what you've been able to do is you got that entrance to the industry almost in a small company view, but you did it with bigger companies, you know, because that's what we always talk about. You know, when whenever you start out in the industry in a small you see everything. And so going from QA to producer, then to designer, you did get to see a lot of those facets and understand because I, I wholeheartedly agree with your your first mentor. If you don't understand how the sausage is made, you don't need mm -hmm. to be making design decisions. <laughs> That's how you end up with the whole, oh, we're just going to add multiplayer and mm -hmm. it goes from there. Um, so with that, what were some of those initial lessons that you carried over from QA to production and then from production into design? Uh, that's a good one. So like from QA to production, communication was number one. Like so many bugs that we would log in the database or like I, I was lead QA for a while. Uh, for a couple projects, and one of those was all the, it was a uh, Whiplash, which was like a PS2 Xbox game. Um, you're like a weasel with a rabbit on a chain, and you're beating the shit out of <laughs> a, a corporation that has been testing on animals. And um, there was so many just like errors of miscommunication, and that's that's the only way I could put it. Is like you'd watch a bug get claim fixed. And then the bill would come through, we'd look at it and yeah, it was fixed, but you really actually introduced a completely other bug for somebody else. And it was like, these people sit in the same, even like cubicle sort of pod, but they're not talking to each other. They're just sort of working in their silos. And, um, it was maybe only a few months before release. We'll just say six. And I got wind of the fact that at some point, we had not even been able to play through the game yet, but at some point I realized the player is going to re-traverse through all of the levels they've gone through. And there's a whole other set of challenges and um, unlocks and collectibles that need to happen for that support. But the game wasn't even playable from start to finish. We didn't even have the ability to do that. And it was just a casual conversation over dinner where somebody mentioned this retraversal part. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> and I started talking to everybody and most people didn't even know what I was talking about. It was only one level designer and the lead designer that knew what I was talking about. And when I realized that no one else was even planning for this, I had to sort of like raise this red flag, but I was QA. I was like, and, and the fact that the rest of the level design team didn't know, the rest of the, the, the artists didn't know, the, the, like some of the programmers may have remembered, but it was just sort of a sense that like, no one's been planning for this. No one's like even told QA and it's like, so how do you, how do you avoid these problems in the future? And it's like, well, communication has to be a thing. This team needs to be playing the game a lot more together. Um, that was definitely one of the first lessons is just like, if we if we're not on the same page of what we're building, we're gonna be pulling in opposite directions way too often. It's too easy. So um, yeah. So your question was from QA to production and production to design. So that was probably like my QA to production one, which is all about communication. And then production to design was 
Oh gosh, like once I, once we went, went into the next gen, the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, uh, we were still chasing realism. We were still trying to make realistic games and that that's sort of how we made money then. So we were going from $20 million budgets to $100 million budgets basically. And all of that money was going into the art pipelines. Um, and so it was my experience with actually scheduling, how are we gonna build this game? We're gonna say we're gonna model San Francisco realistically and we're gonna put earthquake destruction in it. And um, just let going from design white box to an art pass to design gets to move some objects around to like the final art pass, I would track the people over time in what we call a Gantt chart. And I could watch <laughs> just how one small little delay would just <clears throat> explode the Gantt chart and just push the time out. And it was really just in the environment art costs of everything that we were doing in terms of materials, um, fidelity, because we, we really wanted to make this game look good. And a designer would come in a month later and really want to make a change and be like, no, too late. Like, sorry, that 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 interior is locked. Like I know you, it only feels like you're moving a door or something like that, but like that would require so many things to go back. And so it was just sort of that visualization of once you throw, once you pass a checkpoint and say, we're gonna put art on this thing and we're gonna make it pretty, it's like any change is so costly. And I think the same thing happens with like animation and whatnot, but it really just gave my visual brain a space to see how time and people add costs to, to game decisions and why we need to make those decisions a lot earlier before we get them fully arted up. So this entire conversation came about from a, a call that you and I had weeks ago, if not maybe months ago. I don't know, Tom. About a month ago, yeah. Tom doesn't matter in COVID anymore. I don't know what time it is anywhere. We were talking about how, you know, so many developers are afraid to fail, but mm -hmm. it's, it's almost mandatory. You have to, if you do it right every time, you're never going to learn, but you can't let it get, you know, discouraging. So what are some of the ways that you've seen, we'll get into how you prepare for it later, but, you know, some examples of where things have just catastrophically failed but it's not the end of the world because that's what we want you know things are going to keep going things are going to move on you just have to learn from it so what what are some of the things that you've had to deal with and what did you pull out of them yeah um i think some of the bigger examples i think we've probably all seen this if we've been in the industry for any length of time or tried any any sort of project um especially if it's in subjective space, but uh, I'm not going to name any names on this one because it's probably a little too sensitive, but it was... Uh, oh, that's the fun part, Joe. I know, Come I on. know, it is, it is. Um, let me... Well, I can use one that I've actually been on. So uh, Tomb Raider Underworld was the last of the older Tomb Raiders. And it came after... Mm, Tomb Raider Legend and Tomb Raider Legend got a little bit of like um, criticism for the combat and the game and I was working on this other project meanwhile Tomb Raider team is moving on, on with uh, Tomb Raider Underworld and they had said from the start we want better combat but I don't think they made a single change to how they were developing combat everybody just sort of kept the roles they didn't they didn't change the process. They didn't sort of put anybody necessarily in charge of it differently or try a different approach even. They just nose the grindstone and just, let's just get the job done. And then kind of six months before release, they're caught up with like, oh, our combat isn't good enough. Um, and to, I'm gonna sort of swing that into this other example where with without the names, it was, there was an, a bunch of systems that weren't really showing up like for the game they were just we're supposed to have open world police systems we're supposed to have open world combat working we're supposed to have all these objectives and missions 
nothing's quite working yet. And the lead designer would say, wait till it's all done and then we can evaluate it. Because the lead designer had this, it's, it's a hard thing for a lead any, in any position. Because you, you're like, when do you know when to like go back to the drawing board and make a change? Or when do you have to, when do you have to believe in your gut and or your original vector and say, I believe in this, it's gonna work. And so it's so many teams, did they just say, wait till it's all done. And so you're reviewing, it's like, well, the VFX aren't on there and the audio is not on there and we got these bugs, let's, let's fix all that. And the problem with doing that is it pushes you to the deadline and then you're not really evaluating everything until the deadline and you're una you've been unable to, um, some people call it developer goggles or dev goggles, I call it like squinting, like the ability to sort of make my eyes blurry to see what the potential of the system is without having to have all the beautiful, beautiful effects and beautiful animations. And if we can't do that, if we need everything to be done to 100%, we are going to have very costly failures. And often we're going to push it all the way to the deadline where we have no time to adjust. Um, and I would see this, I've seen this on multiple teams where they start play testing in the final two or three months of the game and there's really no way to adjust to anything that playtesters are. And playtesting is separate from QA, right? QA is finding bugs. Playtesting is pulling fans off from the street and trying to just gauge how they're interacting with the game. And with two or three months left, you, your hands are tied. You can make very minor changes. Um, but if you're playtesting way earlier, you can make all the changes in the world. Um, but it's, it's this false sense of just wait till it's all done. Let's get it all to hundred percent and then we'll evaluate. And that's the catastrophic failures. And that I think directly points to my experience of production of seeing how costly it is to get those things to hundred percent. We saw that I learned that lesson very early in my career as well. We would have projects that we knew were, were big projects from clients and we'd be at E3 and it's like, you know, it looks like crap. And they're like, oh, but wait till it all comes together. And, and you know, even 20 years ago, I'm like, that's not going to go well. That's just, it, it, it simply doesn't. So especially when you're working with indie teams. And, and so a lot of these teams will in their head imagine, well, we don't have 14 different departments. There's just six of us that are working on this. It won't be a problem, but it is a problem. So you know, with that aspect of, of failure where you don't want to get to, you know, the point that you're showing the game like on the Steam Festival right now or somewhere else and it looked like, what kind of checkpoints, for lack of a better word, can an indie team implement early in their process to make sure it's not going to be a turd when it comes out? Whew, that's a hard one. I'm dealing with it now too. I've got a, um, so in addition to consulting, I've got one of my own teams who are working on a, on a VR project, which is, I don't advise it for your first project, by the way, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a complicated market, but, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be different for every team. Every team has, you have to be, have awareness of what your team wants to do and what it needs to do. And I think every team is an organism. <laughs> That's sort of like the way to think of it. It's like there is sort of a natural state that every team sort of like works off of and works as. Um, in particular, so my, my VR team, we're called Beyond Our Stars. And the Beyond Our Stars team, whenever, whenever we get together, it is just a creative brainstorm powerhouse. It's like, it reminds me of being like 10 years old and being getting with friends and saying, wouldn't it be cool if, let's imagine this, let's, we're going to build a fort. We're going to spend all day building a fort. And then tomorrow we're going to tear it all down and build something else. And sort of highly creative, highly inventive. But at some point we had to say, what's the core of our game? What's the core gameplay here? There is half, there has to be some nugget to this gameplay that we're going to be repeating over and over and over. And the team didn't want to do that as an organism. That's just not how we worked together. It was like it, once once we were holding the focus to what's the one thing we're going to do all the time. Uh, it was almost like we I sucked all the fun out of the room, and suddenly it was work, and nobody wanted to do it, and we were all dragging our feet because nobody wanted to be the um, person to say this is it. Everybody follow me. We all were trying to do it collectively, and but 
the answer was we have to develop this. We have to get, we're, we will not be a serious business until we identify what the core of this game is. And that was, so we set it as our objective and it took us nine months longer than it should have. But um, we grew a lot as a team in terms of like, what are we building? How are we doing this? That's an anecdotal answer to your question. But I think ultimately it's like, we, we have to sort of identify what is the goal that we're trying to achieve, right? How much money and time do we have to achieve this? And then you got to cut the fluff. Like it's, you really have to focus, like another team I'm working with, great team and uh, they are not funded yet. So the goal is get funded and the team wants to steer into just building the game and building the foundational layers of the game. And I very much appreciate that that's who I am as a developer. But when you're trying to get funded, building those under the hood systems doesn't do anything for the people with dollars and eyeballs that need to see something splashy, something that they can sell. Pretty pictures. Yeah. 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 So it's sort of like, how do we smoke and mirrors all the pretty pictures part? And how do we like, and also how do we promise something that we can deliver on? Because we don't want to like, just make some splashy trailer and then have to go back to the drawing board and be like, okay, well now we got the money. How do we build what we just faked? It's you want to be honest about it and authentic about what you're building. So that, that takes us through a lot of exercises of like, well, and I, one of the answers there is like, well, the goal is get funded. We get funded through splashy events. So let's find the splashy events in our game and let's develop those in a way that gets us there as fast as possible. And so that's, that's, that's entirely what we're doing. And we have, but we have to be aware that as an organism, we will steer into building foundational systems. So every, every meeting we're asking, is there a way that we can fake this for now so that we can do it properly later? So, you know, one, I did mention it earlier, but yes, welcome to the two decade club of, of game <laughs> development. You are now as crazy as the rest of us that have been doing this this long. How do you, I mean, obviously you, you understand the premise. I mean, it's like, you have to be able to fail. You have to understand that it's going to happen and you have to learn from it. What are, you know, the ways that you prepare your team and your clients when you know it's going to happen? You know, it, it's like watching your kid bounce a ball down the stairs. You know it's going to go down the stairs eventually, even though they don't. How do you keep them from going with it down the stairs? Uh, I have a weird answer to that. I let the team fail. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like I let the team fall down the stairs. And I think that's, um, again, like this, this – I've only been saying this today, but like the team as an organism is, is I think it's a real thing. The team has a, has its own muscle memory and we learn through experience. We learn through muscle memory. So the team needs to kind of fail. So how do you bake in failure? Um, I mean, quite literally, like I, my time in publishing, I watched, we had this, um, in, in the big leagues, we use vertical slices, right? And I still hate the term vertical slice. I hate everything that it, it is in the industry, but <laughs> love that quote. And uh, so, but the goal of vertical slice is actually really, it's good. It's let's, let's get the team all together on the same page and just put together something that resembles the game, please. Let's just, everybody work on the same thing for a bit. Um, I never saw a vertical slice succeed on the first try. In my, in my entire career, I've seen a vertical slice um, that was a really beautiful demo and it passed with flying colors, but we had to then <laughs> actually then make everything that we had just faked. So it was sort of like we fooled everybody outside of the studio walls that we had achieved a vertical slice, but we then had to sort of go back and remake all that stuff. So that was the only time I'd ever call it a success. But somewhere along those lines, I told myself, I'm never allowing, if I'm ever a publisher, if I'm ever an investor, if I'm ever a lead design again or anything, I'm planning for two vertical slices at least because you need to, you need the first one to fail. So uh, I was just building out a, another development schedule for the VR team and 
I was looking at it, I was like, oh, I only have one vertical slice in there. But I tell myself is like, oh, I got to be very honest here and just plan for another one. And so it's all about planning for failure, just acknowledging that we are not going to get it right the first time. I'm, as a 20 year vet, I'm going to consider myself an expert. I still give myself three chances to get the thing right. You know, like it doesn't matter if it's a system I've done a hundred times, I'm still going to give myself at least three. And I'm, I feel like I'm an expert. If anybody's just starting, they should give themselves five or one of the, um, one of the lead designers on uh, the Tomb Raider reboot said when they put Melee in the game, they went through 17 iterations of Melee before they landed on the one that they ended on. And I see it. I know it's because I know how they work and I know how they self-analyze and how they throw things out when they're not not working. And it would take that team 17 iterations. I totally believe it. Um, you have to know that it takes that many steps sometimes to get something right before it ships. And so you have to plan for that. So plan, I build, I build failure into the process. Like we check it early, check it off and throw it out when it's not working. The problem is most indie teams can't afford to do 17 iterations on anything or, or they're not no. going to 17 they're, they're, is like wildly too much. Though. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's absolutely correct. I talked to a team yesterday and you know, their entire schedule got delayed by two months because you know somebody turned around and went we have to show this to publishers and what we have is great for our pipeline but we have to actually honest to god go and make something completely different to show mm -hmm. and that's what you have to do with a vertical slice a lot of times and so yeah. it's yeah T take your timeline and take your gantt chart and nearly double it at the beginning and you're looking at something along the way. So uh, we have a question from Facebook, and I absolutely want to jump on this myth. So to escape failure financially, I thought that making money full time and then moving half time to indie game dev, you know, work. Is that going to work? So, you know, I'll, I'll let you take this first. How does it go when you have a full time job, but you're trying to make your indie game work as your full time job? So you're working on it part time. Mm. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, like it, and I think, I think it's a great way to get your toes in the water and sort of feel safe about moving into, uh, the industry. And some of, some of my team is doing that. The, the VR team, two of the four have full-time jobs that are not in games right now. And the entire purpose of us getting that game funded is so that they can move on to it full time. But the way that the team works with that game right now it's completely different from how the team will work when they are full-time. Um, when you work part-time on a game, I don't think you're really showing up for as a team necessarily. If you're a solo dev, that's, that's something. Um, and maybe there's, there's a path forward there, but at some point to make and finish the game, it becomes a full-time job. And yeah, if, if you're with a team, again, it's the organism. If, it's like if you're only popping in on weekends or after hours, um, but then you're expected at some point to be showing up full time, it's going to change the way that you interact with the team. It's going to change the way that the team actually operates. So like, not until you're full time do you actually really get to see how the game is being made. We see the same mentality when companies have been doing contract work you know, to say, okay, we're going to do contract work to fund the indie development, I mean, to fund our own IP development. And we call it, I call it the treadmill. I mean, even me, the first company that I started only lasted three years. And the reason it lasted three years is because we did contract work. And then when we tried to switch from doing contract work to original IP, that's when, you know, the wheels came off everything, you know, so it's a very, I'm not going to say you're always going to fail doing it, but 90% of the time you're going to do it. You know, I'll it's a different mentality it. too. Like when you're doing contract work, you're essentially just saying yes to whoever your client is and you're just getting the job done. And when you're building your own game, it's more than just getting the job done. You're in charge of actually making it subjectively good. And that moves beyond just finishing this animation, just getting it good enough and sending it off, that, that means actually analyzing the thing 
and playing it together as a team and having a sense of what we're building. And that's, it's a completely different environment than just outsourcing work. At least we've got the point where, you know, license, because most of the outsourcing work that we see, you know, involves licensing and, and that sort of stuff. And the good news is we've, you know, advanced beyond just the shit games that I worked on, you know, years ago, where it's like, take this IP and literally slap it on something else and we're going to run with it. Because then, I mean, you're right. It's like, is it good? Doesn't really factor in. It's like, mm -hmm. does it hit all the check marks that the publisher or the licensor, you know, wanted for their marketing spiel? Yes, it does. Run with it. So the... You know, I always tell people it's like the, the story about Cortez landing in the new world. It's like as long as you have the contract work or your full time job that you can step back and rely on, you're never going to really commit. You you have to land and then burn those ships. So there's no, there's no going back before you get <laughs> that's when you get serious about it. So, yeah. you know, one of the things that we had talked about was making sure you're not creating your game in a vacuum. And so especially, I mean, one, we have a tendency to do that in the first place, you know, and it's not just developers. I see investors and publishers do it as well. They only focus on what they're doing or maybe what they're doing and their peers are doing. Yeah. But you're talking about, you know, two, three years of development sometimes. If you're an indie dev and you're doing this part time, you're easily looking at that again. How do you keep you and your team from constantly doing that and, and developing and, and working these projects in a vacuum? It's a really hard one. Um, I feel like I've only in the last quarter of my career been able to open my eyes and become aware of that. And that, then that was largely out of being in publishing and also refusing to drink the Kool-Aid of whatever corporate environment that I operate in. But it's hard because it's let's say let's say we're an indie development team and we're a three person team and we're building a game it's a roguelite for whatever reason and um we start getting some mechanics in there it starts feeling good we're having fun uh got the xp system there's some unlocks we're having fun as a team we're we're proud of what we're building and nothing should stop us from being proud about what we're building but at some point you need to sort of bring your perspective way back and think about where that product is going to sit among all the other roguelikes out there and we can we can feel like our game is approaching spelunky or rogue legacy but if we have to be very honest about if it's going to compete at that level and sometimes i'll get a team of you know 10 20 people and they're they've got a game that could theoretically compete with say Skyrim, but as the 10 and 20 people, they're never gonna be able to create enough content to compete with Skyrim. As 10 and 20 people, they're never going to approach the level of realism of Skyrim. So when they start talking about how much money they might be making, there's a sort of divorce from reality. There, we, we put ourselves into these like reality distortion fields whenever we're building a game and you have to be able to pull yourself out by whatever means possible. I think I've become really good at being able to do that internally with myself, but for other teams, that means putting it in front of players that have never seen your game before, that don't know who you are, that don't feel like they need to compliment you. Like, I literally do the two-way mirror thing so you can watch, watch them play the game and rag on your game, like criticize it. Because you need to actually understand where you sit within not only, not only the games market, but then understand that two, three years out, your game's going to come out and it's going to be competing with other games that are probably have, probably have the same inspiration. We compete with our phones these days. We compete with all sorts of screens. It's, um, this is like two years ago, three, gosh, it was probably four years ago at this point. Netflix said our biggest competitor isn't Hulu. Our biggest competitor or is Fortnite mm -hmm. because they saw their viewer drop numbers drop as Fortnite rose and they saw the correlation in their data and they said, Oh, you know what? We're losing viewers to Fortnite. And I'm sure Epic now can track when players drop from Fortnite, where they're going to, at least just by seeing what's popular in the news. 
Yep. And so we are no longer even like when you're an indie dev, it doesn't matter that you're an indie dev, you're competing on a world stage. That we and, and I had to point that out to to somebody this week. It's you know, there are two hundred to two hundred and fifty games released every week on Steam. You know, I know this because I get an email on Monday <laughs> telling me what launched on Steam last week. I mean, there's 40, 50 games on Switch every week. You you cannot have that tunnel vision of, well, I'm just com competing against the other indie games that are survival based that cost ten dollars. And we just completely lost Joe. He'll be back in a second. Um, but we could touch on something else in the meantime. So uh, Earthman from Twitch said, <laughs> hold on a second. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. Wrong, wrong button. Back um, button, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, Earthman said, can't you make contract work based on revenue share? This way you limit the risk for everyone and you're really invested in the quality you make with the team or am I wrong? The problem with doing revenue share is some, somebody's got to be paying your bills while you're doing the development. And yeah. that that's where you end up getting in trouble. Uh, yeah, look at uh, my uh, colossal failure at big huge games when uh, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning came out. Um, we were owned by 38 Studios who was at the time based out of Rhode Island and big huge games was in Baltimore and we were probably about 100 people maybe maybe a bit more. Um, just because just the game released say I think it was like mid-February um, maybe even March and you kind of expect that you're going to start getting your sales dollars immediately, but oh no, the publisher has recoups and expenses and the publisher takes the money and then they'll drip that money to the, to the developer. So rather than just start making all the money from your first week of game sales, you're, you're sort of sitting <laughs> like just waiting for the cash and it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. And so 38 studios, had this huge hit of a hundred people with all, and we call it the burn rate, the amount of money that we are just burning, burning. cash just to sit around went completely onto their books because no longer was EA paying out milestone payments to get the game done because the game was done. Last milestone payment done, cool. hundred people, Kurt Schilling, 38 Studios, you, you gotta pay them. They weren't ready for that. They were not financially ready for that. They they went immediately bankrupt, like within a month. Like, catastrophically so. Catastrophically. Like <laughs> I didn't get paid. Multiple families didn't get paid. There were like the, the, the whole, we, we found out because a woman that was uh, at the doctor's office for um, just a regular pregnancy check. She was like pretty late into her pregnancy. She was the wife of somebody that worked at, at the company and she was informed that the health insurance had not been paid and it had been canceled. And that triggered everybody just like the whisper network of, wait a second, what else hasn't been paid? Oh, shit. And then paychecks were supposed to come through and did not. And then um, the government of Rhode Island got involved and said, we're, we're done paying you the loan that we had promised. And so the, the company collapsed because I... I'm getting on a tangent a little bit, but the whole thing was it costs money to build the game. It costs mm -hmm. money to pay the workers and you're not making that money until you sell the game. And even when the game's on sale, you're not getting those dollars directly. There's a lot of funnels and buckets that it needs to fill up before it goes back to the developer. And I mean, no, it's, it's not a tangent because that's exactly what you have to keep in mind. And I will say, at least for a lot of, of indie teams and a lot of the contracts that I've done in the last couple of years, having a day one rev share is a little more common now, but it also depends on how much of that the publisher you know is funding. And I imagine EA came in pretty early on this game, and so they probably funded 70, 80% of it at least. And so, yeah, in that case, you're going to see a lot... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you're going to see, they're going to want their money back. But if you don't plan for this, if you don't plan for, you know, how you're going to have six months of, of payroll basically in the bank to, to run off of, this is what happens. And it builds to that communication too. You know, I know from, you know, running a company when things start getting tight, sometimes it's hard to admit that to, you know, yourself and, and to your team. 
But mm -hmm. otherwise, yeah, you end up in these situations where somebody's doctor bill just got went from, you know, 40 bucks copay to $4,000 and nobody knows why. Um, all right. So hold on. We got another question here from Nightwolf. If an indie dev decides to go down the asset creation route, would they be able to speed up their timeline for game dev production due to asset reuse or asset editing? Would buffing the portfolio for future use make it help more than making it during the game development process? I'll leave it up there. I certainly believe so. Um, the The interesting thing is I have a, um, and it's maybe my own experience, but my own experience tells me that it's not the art costs where we spend failure. We spend failure in the gameplay, the game design, the meaningful choices with the player. And art doesn't always need to be there to evaluate those things. So there's a way to build where you're essentially, you're standing up systems, you're, you're getting some art in there because you need to understand your pipelines but you're really trying just to build out the core of your game and evaluate, is this fun? Can we build a whole game off of this? Um, ways to mitigate the art costs, absolutely. I think that you should always look, look for that, especially as an indie developer. Um, go for stylized art, control the camera so you can't have to see, the player can't whip, whip around and see in 360 degrees. Um, do whatever it takes to be very like, to focus on how good your game looks as often as possible. Um, and I'm all about reuse on the technical side and the art side, but I feel like most of the thrashing of failure and iteration should happen in the early gameplay, game design choice space and not in the art space. So uh, I think it's, it's a, you should absolutely use Feel free to use uh, contract like libraries, uh, outsource art, reuse, reuse assets all the time, definitely. But the the savings are by making decisions earlier in your game design. Do you think we see because we have had a big resurgence of you know pixel art type games, you know, basically pulling back from let's make the most eye dropping thing, you know, mm -hmm. eye popping thing possible to you know, more of that retro look. Do you think we see a lot of that for artistic sake or is that to help some of these teams actually iterate faster and develop faster without having to worry about what level of shaders are in the damn thing and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I think it's a, it's certainly a bit of both. I mean, um, me as a gamer, nostalgia is, brings me back, right? So it's like a, to see pixel art embraced and actually the, the advances that happen in pixel art and games, um, just both in terms of speed and tools, like it's pretty cool to see like how, it's still slow. It's, it's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's way faster than say they were building sprites in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it achieves a unique look. At some point, we're going to sit back and we're and we, we may be already there. We're going to sit back and we can say all these pixel art games look the same. All these voxel games look the same. But we're already saying that with anything that's realistic. Any, any military shooter, we're like, gosh, all these military shooters all look the same. <laughs> we were saying that 10 years ago. I'll still say that now. Um, and the problem with the realism vector is that the costs just go exponentially higher and higher and higher. So, like... I, if you're an indie team and you want to make a military shooter, it's like, by all means, go for it, but don't try and compete with Call of Duty in terms of art fidelity and realism. Like, go stylized. Like, even look at, say, like, like, like Fortnite's really beautiful. Overwatch is really beautiful. They're heavily stylized. So I would find an even simpler version of stylization so that your art costs don't send you into the 60 plus million dollar budget range yes because i didn't got this geforce 30 80 whatever i have here now so i could play a pixel game that's exactly <laughs> you know what it was the other advantage though in in this you know is, is especially key for indie teams you've got you know to survive basically you've got to make that long tail of sales 
as long as humanly possible. If you go too heavy down the realism route, the team that's coming out six months from now, a year from now, with their realism, you know, look and feel is going to look yeah. better than yours. Whereas if you've yeah. gone the stylized route with Fortnite and Overwatch, you've got more longevity in there because you're not trying to do, you know, all all of the all of the fancy stuff in there. Now I'll admit yeah. I turned on ray tracing in Fortnite and then I couldn't tell what changed. So, you know, it's we we've gotten so good at simulating ray tracing. <laughs> I know. It's like <laughs> I literally but sat there I, and I was like, I, I don't know what changed. So, at <laughs> extreme expense. There's so much materials and shader pipeline nonsense that just, I like, mean, really cool tech that goes into all these things just to get that look. And the fun thing is ray tracing doesn't need it necessarily. So it sort of, it may simplify the development pipeline and give you a, a better look. Um, I think going back to the sprite question, it's like, well, that's cool. Like, I'd love to see an interesting lighting engine on a sprite game that's using ray tracing and see what you could do with that. Um, but the honestly, like, embrace sprites. Like, I think I'm. I I love that the indie world says, "Let's play in the spaces that are not realism, and let's make that our look. Let's make that unique." Um, one of the things that the marketing team at EA told me with the uh, Kingdoms of Amalur, they were like, you know, the game feels really good, and when players play it, they get it. They understand why it's different from a fable or something else. But when they see screenshots, they can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard for us as a marketing team because we're trying to sell your game, and everybody that sees it says, well, that's fable. I've played it before. And whether or not we're trying to, oh, no, it's different. We got Todd McFarlane, we've got Ari Salvatore, and well, yada yada yada. Doesn't really matter because our brains do this thing. And um, Cliff Blazinski, uh, formerly of Epic, uh, he had this term. He called it pattern match dismissal, and I love it because it's what we do. Just our human brains are so good at like matching patterns, and so uh, you can show me a game, and if I've played a game or seen a game that is remotely like it, I will visually just m place it into that memory space and be like, I feel like I've played that game before. I can, it's just like this other game. It's just like Mario. It's just like Sonic. It's just like Rogue Legacy. It's just like Slay the Spire. That's the one that I keep hitting. I'm like, that's Slay the Spire. I've already played that game. I love that game, but I don't need to play another, somebody else's version of Slay the Spire. And it's what I'm doing is I'm pattern match dismissing <laughs> and dismissing. And we need to make sure that our games at a screenshot level, even, communicate that this is a unique experience. And so even if you're doing a sprite-based game, it's like it should have something that pops out and that tells me as a player, I have no idea what this is, and or I this feels more interesting or, or unique. It's offering me something special that any comparison that I have, I don't have a comparison for. Like I, I want the unique experience of this game. I'll admit, I have that exact problem with Metroidvanias. It's like, mm -hmm. I see it, uh, even a video clip, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, all right, so I'm going to kill something and then jump on something and then jump on something else and then kill something else. And there is more to a lot of these games than that aspect of it. I mean, even Rogue Legacy, you know, that that's a good example. But if you can't convey that, you know, in your trailer, in your screenshots, then yeah I, I i like that term i had actually never heard that that's that's something i learned today and no div you don't need to go all the way the route of dwarf fortress with ascii art to um to you know prove a point although i did i don't know if it was on the steam festival yesterday or some random piece i saw a game that was laid out in ascii art but it was in 3d so you could look <laughs> at it you know from the top like these games do but then when you rotate it it was like full-blown i guess stacks of at symbols or whatever but it was that was something that i was like oh my god that is actually really cool um uh, don't remember what it was but i remember seeing it that was you know the big thing um uh, so 
Let's go back to your military shooter thing, because I like this the, the realism. But you, you do, oh my god, we see so many of them, and it's like, okay, that's roughly the same game. So if your team, you know, for example, has a long track record in realistic military shooters, in many cases, when you start working on your own project as, a, as an indie studio, that strength becomes a weakness, you know. So how do you go about, you know, building your project so you can actually turn those, you know, those strengths that became weaknesses back into strengths again? Yeah, that's that's a that's a tough question. So like in that specific example, I mean, you can look at Respawn and Respawn is a big studio, but they are they were building Call of Duty style games way back in the day. And they've moved on to um, oh, the, the name Titans. Uh, Titanfall. Titanfall. Yeah. But then Apex came out of Respawn. And Apex was... I, I'm on the outside, so I'll say something just kind of... I, I had heard rumors of what it was like to be working at Respawn. Not on the Apex team, but I heard from people outside of the Apex team joking about the Apex team, saying, just make Titanfall 3. That's what everybody wants. And the team was being stubborn <laughs> and sticking to their guns, so to speak, and saying, we're going to build a Battle Royale shooter. Like, it, at, in a time where Fortnite already existed, and everybody was saying, like, many, for, many Battle Royale shooters were coming out, by the way, and failing. And there was a sense of, like, why is Respawn building Apex? And then Apex launched, I think, right behind um, Anthem, which is the Bioware, mm -hmm. yep. like, hot, like, supposed to consume your life RPG shooter, and it just collapsed, and Apex, it's, lo and behold, everybody's playing Apex. I'm not going to say Apex is incredibly realistic. They've certainly started to move towards stylization, but they're moving away from the military roots that they really understood. And they're leveraging their engine. And that, I think that's where we talk about strengths and the weakness. It's like leverage what you've got and sort of at the core. It's not so much in the final execution, the way that it appears to everybody else. It's like, look at the strengths that you have at the procedural level, like the process of the tools and technology. And sometimes you may have an artist that is really also good at technical art, coming up with fun ways to sort of, there's this guy at Crystal, he's no longer there now, he works for the Mozilla um, VR space named Jim Conrad. And Jim came into the industry as an artist, but then started learning all the 3D tools and then became a designer. And with this artist designer brain, he would draw up the most, the coolest things. Like he threw a camera behind Lara Croft, but then he threw the engine, attached some aspect of the camera um, tilt to one of Lara's bones on her spine so that as Lara was walking across a tightrope beam, so Lara's doing this, the camera would actually take some of that tilt. And for the player, it just brought the sense of like, whoa, I'm going to fall off the edge as she, as Lara's tilting. We felt as the player, our, our position's also tilting. But that only came through the mind of this hybrid artist designer who could technically com like mesh worlds. And over time, this guy, Jim Conrad, just kind of had his own desk where he could just come up with ideas and they were almost always useful sometimes we built an entire game system around them sometimes it was just a neat little tech demo and we we're like that's awesome jim like keep doing stuff and you really need to find your your gems your the people that like have these extra strengths and see what they can sort of bring to the table and you need to, and that's where also back to failure give them the space to try things out um one more example is that at Big Huge, we had we had a moment where the studio studio got sold, dropped by THQ, and we were in kind of limbo. We were being shopped around, like, who's going to buy us? It's going to be EA, it's going to be 2K. Eventually, it was 38 Studios. It was about four months. 
and we had already built out the level design team. It was a full level design team of like quest writers, level designers, artists, probably about 40 people. Um, and I kind of sat back. I wasn't even on that team, but I had, I had seen that we had just finished our level design tool and our quest tool, and they were just about ready to get started being used. So rather than everybody just sit around waiting, we just said, you know what, let's just, as a team, let's all 40 of us, and I jumped on the team with them, and I just said, we're going to just make some levels. And we spent, I think, two months just making levels and reviewing them together. And through that process, we all leveled up as level designers, as quest writers, but we also had a bunch of feedback for the engine team and the tools team that had built the level design tool and the quest tool. And we ran that system and the team through all the paces. So by the time we came out of that and then the, the game got purchased or the studio got purchased, that team was ready to really be making levels because they were on paper ready to be making levels, but they hadn't gone through the paces of just like, let's just get all the bad ideas out of there. So by taking that window and just trying things, we were able to level each other up. And so it's like, that was a weakness. We didn't know, we didn't know who was going to buy us. We had a huge team that was costing a lot. And I said, great, let's just use this time to learn rather than to make the game Something. that we don't know is because we didn't know what, what the game was going to be at that yeah. point. One thing you can count is when you have changes in leadership, be it at the corporate level or at the you know design lead level or producer level, your shit's going to change on your game, and it may everybody's got to come and put their stamp on it. Yeah. So, I mean, you you've almost come full circle back to what we were talking about at the very beginning here, where you know being able to come up through one of these studios and having a multitude of different roles from QA to producer to designer gives you different you know ways of looking at things so you know for the indie devs out there you know somebody spent their entire career coding or someone spent their entire career on the art side what are some of the things that they can do to help give them perspective into these other aspects of game development I think you gotta talk and work together. Like, um, Discord's awesome. Like, by the way, like I, we're in a pandemic and we can't necessarily be in the same room together. But uh, some of my teams, they'll just get on Discord together. And at first, it started out they'll get on Discord and they'll work on their separate things. But then um, one, so this is a VR team, and so one one guy was working on a just sort of special side project you want to do. You want to sort of get an NPC to pick up a thing and throw it and then maybe have the player catch it and throw it back. But he was just starting on just like the NPC picking up an object and just how do I do that? And he's an artist and he's just first time looking at Blueprint. And the other guy, James, is in the Discord. So they start asking questions and looking at it together. And something kind of magical started happening. And it started happening more and more where they start, Hey, I wanted to keep working on this James. Do you have time? And they'd get on discord together. They'd work for two hours and it would be, it'd start with a quick little 15 minute question and then spiral out into three hours working together on this thing. And then last week, um, two weeks ago, they, they, in our team meeting, they just said, you know what, from here on out, we just want to work on focused things together because we end up with better, final result we learn together and it just feels so good to be working together on something and i think that's the part of game development it doesn't matter if it's a hundred person team or a three person team or even two or like if we'll talk about the one in a second but we tend to isolate we tend to silo we tend to think that's this is my job that's your job and if the problem is in art space and I'm a programmer, then it's not my problem. And I think the role of the, the, the next level of develop, developer thinks more in terms of what is the final product? What is the actual goal here? How can I contribute? Like when we work together and we understand how we both can affect the thing, it's like the solution space opens up. One of my favorite questions to ask any team, like, um, and I learned this from being a producer of programmers who are all very smart, much more intelligent than me. And they'd come at me with like this, like, 
I got to do this. It's going to take three months. It's going to do all this stuff. It's all this back end localization tool. And I, I, I learned this from another producer. I just sit there and I, I ask him, this is the question. What is the problem you are trying to solve? Because I'd be just sitting and hearing arguments of pros and cons of different people's solutions. What is the problem you are trying to solve? If we can agree what the problem case is, suddenly the solution space opens up. When we hit each other with solutions and we're just talking about pros and cons, we're not necessarily even identifying all the other potential solutions that are out there. And so I think when we work together on a product, we come up with better solutions. We come up with solutions that haven't been seen before, and we come up with solutions that hopefully play to our unique strengths. Um, I think if you're like solo coder and you're contracting out all your art, I think there's a limit to the solutions that you will have because you're not thinking into what artists can do to help your problem. So I'd say even then though, like pay for someone's time to just sort of riff with you and understand how art can contribute to solving your problem. All right, so we are almost out of time here. But so if you've got questions, no matter where you are, pop them in chat. We'll see them. We'll get them answered. Uh, any questions on production, planning, you know, how to fail and how to fail well. So Earthman's got a question. How do you personally avoid social issues for specific groups within your team, which are, you know, let's be honest, political issues as well? Yeah, in this day and age, it's sort of hard to make anything not political. So um, in the same way that you have to be willing to fail in design decisions or anything else, you have to be willing that that requires a sense of honesty and ability to acknowledge that you're wrong, just in game design and game development. So if, if we approach things and I say, hey, Here's my idea. I want to build this sort of shining city on a hill. It's going to have all this cool gravity tech and blah, 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 blah. This is my game development idea. I may even sometimes preface it as this is a straw man or this is a prototype. This is not the final thing, but I think this is, this is kind of where I'm thinking. Hit me with your feedback. Criticize it. Call me out for saying I was going to do something else and then coming to you with something totally different. And I think the same thing happens in social issues with teams. It's like, we are going to run, we are groups of creative people. Early Crystal Dynamics, for instance, was super punk rock. We had people that were goth musicians. Um, we had, we had actual, just sort of like people that were, uh, I'm not even gonna name all the things that were going on in the studio, but there were elite businessmen and women and skaters and punks and artists, everybody. And everybody had a different opinion of how games should be built and how even a hierarchy should be imposed on people. And you just had to try things and be open, be willing to have arguments and debates and people were gonna get offended. People are going to get offended. Like this, this happens and you have to say, be open to correcting yourself as as a group as an individual as leadership like social issues are going to come up so go in there with full awareness that you will probably make mistakes and you will probably step on some toes and then it's on you to correct those things i i like this is just how we behave as humans like in order to be creative we have to allow each other to sort of express themselves as much as they want and there's a point where that needs to stop and it becomes harmful and we need to identify where it's harmful and find ways to stop it so it's like i think that will always be i'm, I'm 20 years in it's always going to be that space of potentially offending people and having to look inward and understand is this is something that i need to change as a person or we need to change as an organization maybe and that's that's the same attitude that we have to approach game development from anyway and you know like your game design you can't 
let your social sphere in that studio be a tunnel. You have to look around and see, oh, okay, wait, this, this company is like imploding right now and in the news for all the wrong reasons. And we do a lot of the same shit that they do. So maybe we should, you know, be careful. So, uh, but Joe, dude, thanks for coming on, man. This is, this is fun. I like getting on here and, and talking about things that people probably don't want to hear about, you know, how you should fail, but you need to hear this industry is not flowery and rosy and wonderful all the time. The majority of games fail, but you got to learn from it. Yeah. Let's not be afraid of it. Awesome, dude. All right. So we will be back next week. You know, I'm going to leave you with the same outro. I always do. We have a guest. I don't know who it is off the top of my head. So we will, <laughs> we will get that out. It will let you know. Uh, but in the meantime, don't forget, we've got our master classes coming up where we've got some of the smartest folks in the industry teaching you everything from business to narrative design, all sorts of things. You can go to powellgroupconsulting.com slash masterclasses or just go to indiegame.business. Everything's there. Discord, the podcasts, the conferences we've got coming up, all that sort of stuff. Check it out. Let us know how we can help. And Joe, thank you so much. We'll be seeing you on the Discord. Yep. Thanks, Jay. Alrighty. Bye, everybody.